The late 19th and early 20th centuries saw a massive rise in wealthy industrialist families in the United States. Families like the Vanderbilts, the Carnegies, and the Rockefellers became, in a way, some of the biggest celebrities of their time. They were also involved in massive philanthropic projects. We have places like Vanderbilt University. We have Carnegie Hall and Rockefeller Center in New York as part of the massive amounts of money that they spent on these philanthropic endeavors. For a lot of this philanthropic work and just their success in business, often these wealthy industrialists were nicknamed the captains of industry by a lot of people in the United States. However, the truth isn't quite as rosy as that because the United States did end up seeing a lot of the same social issues created by industrialization that we saw in Great Britain. Coupled with massive immigration coming mostly from Europe in order for people who wanted to get a piece of this new American prosperity. And what this also led to was the growth of overcrowding and slums in some of the major industrial cities in America. And so because of this, another nickname often attributed to these wealthy industrialists was the term robber barons, because they were making all of this immense wealth off of the hard work of people who just weren't getting any share of those profits. One of the ways that society learned about some of these issues was through the work of journalists and a fantastic new piece of technology, the camera. And photojournalism exploded as a way of documenting what was going on in the world. One photojournalist, a man by the name of Jacob Reese, published a book in 1890 called How the Other Half Lives, where he documented the living conditions in some of the slums of New York. When his book and the work of other journalists were published, it produced outrage in society about, you know, how can we let people live and work in conditions like this? But again, the US wanted to avoid some of these more radical responses in Britain, and so what developed during this progressive era was this idea of cooperation between government, labor, and industry in a way to make capitalism work for everybody. One of the major contributors to all of this were labor unions. And labor unions were seeing dramatic growth in order to advocate for workers' rights. But traditionally in the United States, government would have either been totally hands-off or straight up sided with industry. And it wasn't out of the ordinary for the government to step in and even use the military or National Guard to break up workers' strike. This all changed during the administration of President Theodore Roosevelt. One of his major policy platforms was what he called the Square Deal. And the Square Deal involved trying to create a system where everybody is treated fairly, both workers and business. One of the major challenges to the Square Deal came during the 1902 coal strike, where coal workers in the United Mine Workers Union went on strike to pressure the mine owners for better wages and working conditions. The mine owners went to President Theodore Roosevelt and his administration and basically asked the government to break up the strike. Roosevelt, however, said he wouldn't do it, much to the shock of the mine owners who had had this preferential treatment from the government up until this point. But Roosevelt believed that it wasn't the job of the government to take sides, but to act more as a mediator and bring both sides to the table and hopefully be able to come up with a fair solution. Obviously, the mine owners weren't too happy about this and Roosevelt went as far as threatening to use the US Army if necessary to protect the mine workers on strike. And this was a massive shift in the way the US government approached these labor and business challenges. In the end, the coal mine operators had to make concessions on working hours and wages. Another example of initiatives in welfare coming from the side of industry comes through the work of Henry Ford. Now, Henry Ford was the owner of the Ford Motor Company, and he was becoming exceptionally wealthy off of the production of his Ford Model T, which was this mass-produced car that was sold at a much lower price point than his competitors, in part because of his really clever use of assembly line technologies and so on. And here, Ford saw an opportunity both 
for workers, but also for himself. In 1916, Ford massively bumped up the wages of the workers in his factories to a whopping $5 a day, which at the time was quite a high wage. And his belief was that if you know workers got to share in the profits of his company a little bit through higher wages, well, they'd be making more money and would actually be able to afford his cars. So Ford found a way to benefit himself and his profits while also paying his workers more. Sometimes, however, government did have to get involved in order to make this capitalist system work for everybody. In the 19th century, the US government passed a law called the Sherman Antitrust Act, which was intended to break up monopolies. In the capitalist system, monopolies are one of the worst things that could possibly happen. Because if one business is able to totally corner the market, of a particular good or service while well, they can charge whatever they want for it and there's no competition which leads to lower prices and innovation and so it actually ends up being much worse for consumers. The most prolific use of the Sherman Antitrust Act was in 1911 against John D. Rockefeller's company Standard Oil. By this point Rockefeller's Standard Oil had pretty much totally cornered the oil market in the United States. President William Howard Taft used the Sherman Antitrust Act to break up Standard Oil from being just this one monopoly into several smaller companies operating in different regions in the United States. Now, while you might think this would be a pretty big blow to Rockefeller losing his big monopoly, Rockefeller was a pretty shrewd industrialist and he invested a lot of money into these new companies that were formed out of Standard Oil. And as a result of competition, these companies continued to get wealthier and wealthier. And as a result, one of his quotes around this was that he always tried to make every disaster into an opportunity. In this case, he was certainly able to do that. And so this brings us to the state of welfare capitalism today. Today, we see this through companies who offer lots of benefits to their employees, things like health insurance programs, to stock options, to retirement savings plans, and generous vacation and flex time. And companies do this in part to attract the best talent possible and make their company somewhere that workers want to work. Often this is supported with government legislation like minimum wage laws, but also the continuing work of unions who advocate on the behalf of workers for better working conditions. However, the question remains about whether corporations do enough to ensure the welfare of their workers. And this is one of the biggest challenges in economics today. And to what extent should the government continue to regulate and legislate corporations to ensure better welfare versus their ability to do that on their own? And this is an issue with many different perspectives and the debate continues. And with that, thank you for watching and we will see you again next time.